it's just such a an emotional moment and then nice when we're able to capture that in photos and stuff but and then they'll just be talking and then they're like becomes best buds for life after that and it's just a really special moment when they get to like see that something they wrote they created in their mind and put on paper and then this illustrator comes and creates you know their interpretation of it and it's just been a huge like emotional event every year and uh, it's something definitely we look forward to that happens like a couple days before the big gala event Welcome to the Stark Reflections on Writing and Publishing podcast. There has never been a better time for writers. More information, options, and opportunities are available to you. But navigating these requires insight. Join Mark Leslie Lefebvre as he draws upon more than a quarter century of experience as a writer, a bookseller, and a trusted book industry consultant to explore and reflect on the writing and publishing landscape to help you make informed choices on your writer journey. Hello, Reflectives, and welcome to episode 179 of the Stark Reflections podcast. This is your host, Mark Leslie Lefebvre. In this episode, I have an interview with Emily Goodwin about writers and illustrators of the future. Now, Emily is the Vice President of Public Affairs for Author Services, Inc., based in Los Angeles, California. She's been involved with book publishing since 2007, including the International Writers and Illustrators of the Future contests. She is the producer for the Writers of the Future Annual Achievement Awards, as well as the Online Writing Workshop. She's been active with the IBPA Benjamin Franklin Awards as a judge. She's involved in community activities in the greater Los Angeles area and has been vice president community outreach for the Hollywood Christmas Parade since 2014. Emily has also been an honorary commander for the U.S. Air Force since 2018 and, as of 2020, the U.S. Space Force. But even cooler than all those amazing things. Emily is an expat fellow Canadian. Yeah, okay. Maybe that's more cool to me than many of my listeners, but still, she's a cool Canadian, eh? Now, it was great to catch up with Emily after not having seen her for several years, and we have a fascinating discussion of the amazing opportunity for beginning science fiction fantasy and horror writers via Writers of the Future. But that's coming up later in this episode. Right now, let's get to a word from this episode's sponsor. This episode is sponsored by Findaway Voices. Findaway Voices is a platform that allows authors to get their audience out into a global market. Whether you're looking for a professional narrator to work with, or if you already have the audio files ready, and you're looking for a way to distribute that to a wide global audience, Findaway Voices has you covered. If you are looking for a narrator, they offer the opportunity to put in an RFP, Basically explain what your book's uh, going to be about, the theme, the genre, the kind of voices you're looking for. And then they have professionals from inside the audiobook industry who have experience doing this thing, producing audio. They go to the thousands of professional narrators that Findaway has from around the world, and they find you the top five or ten voices that they believe would be effective for your audiobook, and you work with them from there to find the right narrator. They have different price ranges available. They even have royalty sharing options where you pay the narrator 50% of their normal rate, uh, the hourly rate. Let's say it's a $300 per hour rate. So you'd pay them $150 uh, per hour instead of $300. And then you split the shares with the narrator. And that allows you and the narrator to get in with the least amount of cost up front. And of course, the least amount of risk for the narrator as well. So it's kind of a fair and even distribution where everyone gets an opportunity. If you have the audiobooks available, they allow you to upload the audio. They even have a new tool available to validate and verify so you don't run into any issues with downstream distribution. It basically helps as that additional check just to make sure everything's good to go. Now, I've been using Findaway Voices for years, and I've had some great experience. I uh, will be talking later about uh, the latest novel that I've just released and how I'm leveraging Findaway Voices to distribute that. But I've also done short fiction with Findaway Voices. And one of the benefits of short audio is you're paying by the hour. And so if it's a short story, maybe 10,000 words long, because it's about 9,000, 10,000 words for an hour, 
that's a little bit more affordable. And those are the types of things that are not going to sell in places like Audible, but they do sell through the library market, both through the uh, one-to-one uh, audiences as well as cost per checkout. But that's the beauty of audio and digital is there's all kinds of experimentations you can do. And if you're looking to check out how you might want to get involved in making, creating, selling audiobooks, you can check out Findaway Voices and you can check them out over at starkreflections.ca slash findaway. In terms of a personal update, uh, so today I'm recording this on Thursday, February 25th for the episode to be released on the 26th of February. And on the 23rd, this Tuesday, I launched Fear and Longing in Los Angeles, which is the latest novel in my Canadian werewolf series. It's it's technically the fourth book, but only book two. It's a, a second full-length novel. I've got um, the, the free this time around, 10,000 word short story. Then the novel, uh, which is book one, a, a Canadian werewolf in New York, then I have Stowaway, about a 20,000-word novella, which is kind of like book 1.5. And then, of course, Fear and Longing in Los Angeles. And so that was just released this last Tuesday. Now, a couple things that I uh, screwed up and made mistakes on. Uh, obviously, I uh, was delayed in the in the writing, which meant that the editing was, uh, was delayed. Uh, and I didn't have a lot of time to go back through uh, the notes from my editor in uh, enough time to, to give it proper, um, I guess, a, a proper read through. So I'm going back and I'm making changes and fixes, but then I'm not going back and rechecking those changes and fixes. So uh, a couple interesting things uh, that I learned that I want to share with you in case this is useful. So I sent the completed manuscript after I went through it after my editor to Scott Overton, who's the narrator, he's the voice of Michael Andrews, uh, so that he could record it. Now, I'd mentioned earlier from Find Away Voices, the way I'm doing this with Scott is I pay Scott directly. He gives me the files. I actually am going to be adding uh, the, the, the acknowledgements at the end of the book in my voice, as well as a few other uh, things I'm going to be adding to the audio on that. I'm going to upload it to Find Away Voices. And that's how I've done all of the um, uh, Canadian werewolf books with Scott. He's done all of them for me, and I hope he can continue to do it because I love his voice. I love the way he does it. And... Um, one of the cool things about working with Scott is prior to actually, you know, getting into the studio and reading it, he has a home studio. He is a retired uh, DJ, uh, a morning uh, morning DJ radio personality for, for many, many years. So he's also, uh, he knows sound and has a great voice. And uh, he's got some equipment and so he has a home studio where he does this. But he reads through the manuscript first and he makes notes and just wants to understand the different voices, etc. But then while he's reading through them, he highlighted certain things that he thought might be typos and he even caught a um, <laughs> something that I snuck past my developmental editor and, uh, and they didn't notice because I was kind of vague about some things. But it had to do with the phases of the moon and I was mucking about with uh, phases of the moon. Uh, Michael uh, turns into a werewolf when the phases of the moon are 80% or more. And so all of the stories so far uh, are specifically set on dates where uh, that's an important factor. And so I have that uh, being an issue in the, uh, well in the prologue there's an opening scene where he's on a plane, he's in LA and he's heading back to New York. And there's uh, a weird delay that's going to mean he's going to be in, in the air when he turns into a werewolf. And and then you flash back to, you know, um, a few weeks earlier when he's in New York and preparing to go to L.A. And you kind of take him through the story from there. And then you eventually get to that scene. And I mucked about with uh, the percentage of the moon. But Scott actually <laughs> paid attention because, again, he's read all of these books. And he did, he did uh, well, he did the short story, the 10,000 word short story quite a while ago but he did uh, a Canadian werewolf in New York and still away probably within uh, a few months of each other because I think I had him do them all around the same time as, as I was relaunching everything for August 2020 with new covers etc and he caught these and uh, and then there was a couple other logistical things where he says well Michael says this one thing but I know for a fact that in the last book he actually did this and 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 it was kind of cute because I emailed him back and uh, I was like, yeah, well, he, he's lying. <laughs> he's actually, he's trying to deceive her, you see. Uh, so, uh, and so I had to go back and make that a little bit more clear. 
uh, that, 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 that he was lying, that it wasn't a factual uh, mistake, uh, which was, uh, you know, a sign of, of something that I, I missed doing uh, as a writer and he picked up on. But that means that, uh, so I got to the end of this and I know the next book in the series, I've already put it up for pre-order, it's called um, Fright Night's Big City. And it's coming out in December, and I haven't started writing it yet because I'm, um, I'm madly working on Wide for the Win, uh, which is due very soon. And because um, I like doing that to myself, apparently. But it reminds me that I need to get the manuscript uh, done back with my editor and then send it to Scott early for two reasons. Early because uh, I know myself that when I'm reading a script, you, you, it doesn't matter how many times you and an editor have looked at it, you still find typos. And so uh, getting it to Scott early uh, so he can uh, have a look through it, but then also getting it to him early enough so that I can actually release the audio when I release the hardcover paperback and ebook. So again, some mistakes that I made along the way. Uh, so, the, so the book was released. Another mistake I made along the way. So with Draft to digital, you can do a asset list pre-order, which means you can put up the cover and a description and a price, and they send it to most of the retailers uh, without an asset. And uh, they won't do that for uh, Amazon, but they do it for most of the platforms, not some of the libraries. And so that way it can be up for pre-order on Apple, Nook, uh, Kobo, etc. And there was a deadline uh, to get the uh, to get that in, and then oh, so the, the, I did the hardcover through Ingram Spark, uh, where I had the pre order uh, available. I set that up, and on Amazon uh, KDP Print, I wanted to do the paperback, but they don't allow pre orders on on print books, even if you have the file ready. So. Even though I had the the file ready, you know, five or six days in advance, I couldn't upload it because I wanted it to release on a Tuesday. And 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 again, there's this timing thing. So I kind of went, oh yeah, okay. So I got everything ready. I did you know ninety percent of the way, you know, approved the proof online. Everything looks good. And then I and I went back and said, oh yeah, I've got to, um, uh, you know, on on late on the twenty second, I'll hit the publish button. It'll probably publish sometime when I'm sleeping. So in the meantime, uh, I got uh, some additional notes back from Scott after I had all the final files done. <laughs> and it was like, oh, this little, and I know there were little things, like oh, there's a little type, typo, but also even it required uh, changing like the date on, on one of the things because of the moon and stuff. Because Scott helped me realize that, yeah, I can't get away with trying to, you know, hey, look over there. <laughs> so he helped me with that. So I went back and I madly uh, fixed those things. Uh, spent hours going back and, and fixing those things, got the new files loaded and everything, and then even got the new uh, EPUB loaded. Now, Amazon had blocked the EPUB, uh, and which was weird, uh, in that last 24 hours, so I couldn't update the EPUB. So I was I was sitting there panicking the, the night before on the 22nd, and then just a couple hours before midnight, they unlocked it, probably because it was already midnight somewhere else in the world where they were delivering it. And I uploaded the EPUB, and then I went to bed, and I was like, I'm just tired. And I forgot to upload, or to, to approve, just to hit the publish button on the PDF for the, the trade paperback. And so I didn't do that until I woke up, so around, uh, after I got the animals fed, around 6 a.m. in the morning. And then, it could, of course, it took 18 hours, so it, it, it didn't actually appear until the end of the day. So I just sat back and thought, well, I'm going to want to wait till everything's in play, and everything looks good. Uh, that I have the hardcover, the paperback, and the ebook uh, all up. So I didn't do any sort of promotion or pushes. I was also busy. I was doing all kinds of things. Um, I was doing uh, work for Draft to Digital. I was doing some uh, interviews and uh, stuff like that. I was interviewed on um, the Naked Podcaster. Uh, Jen Taylor had me on uh, on her uh, show. It was a live video, an hour long broadcast, and then uh, the recording is there. And of course, she uh, the, the gimmick uh, is she uh, is naked. Uh, you can't see anything. She just has her robe off, and, and the camera's cut off strategically, so you you can't actually see uh, the, the nudity. Uh, but uh, it's a it's an interesting uh, gimmick. And so I thought when in Rome. And and so what I did is I I, I was also uh, naked. I think she's only had a handful of guests who've who've done that. And and and, and the shtick is it's obviously it's it's a um, you know it's, it's like a shock uh, value, but she uses naked in the term of bearing all and in terms of um, just being open and transparent. 
and so it's more of a of a figurative thing than a little literal thing although it is literal but it's not about the nudity it's about being open and i had a really frank and open conversation with her sharing all kinds of deep intimate <laughs> secrets and 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 uh, thought provoking uh, uh things about about my life it was a great conversation but um it was uh why am i going there oh yeah so uh, i did not do much to promote uh the book but in the meantime i had applied for a few promos and i'm pretty excited i'll be talking about them in detail once this happens but I got, after years and years of rejections uh, from BookBub, I applied for a Canadian Werewolf in New York book one uh, to be in an international BookBub. So it means it doesn't include the U.S., it's just the other markets. And I, I got it. I, I was accepted. 99 cents on March 11th. And so what I did is I went back and I tried to promo stack. So I went, I think uh, I've got a bargain book C uh, as well, either the 11th or the 12th. I've got... Um, uh march 12th i have a wait no so march 12th is the book Bub international uh, march 11th i have the bargain book c march 13th i have e-reader news today i think it's the 13th um march 14th is a fussy librarian march 15th is an ebook aru and march 15th is also a robin reads and then on the 17th i have uh what is that book adrenaline and um i also have um this time around the free one it's going to be Kobo free first in series. It got accepted for March 1st to 7th. And on March 8th, I have a fussy librarian promo for this time around. And I'm probably going to look to see if I can get an additional this time around. So this time around is the free lead in. I got uh, Canadian Werewolf in New York for 99 cents for a week. And I'm using that. I'm pushing really, really hard on those two sort of funnel introductory books in the hopes that it increases the sales. And, and I have seen... Uh, a small, uh, but, uh, you know, uh, appreciable, like something I can actually see the the, the lift on both uh, Canadian Werewolf in New York and Stowaway already that uh, coincided with the launch of Fear and Longing in Los Angeles. I already do have Fright Night's Big City up for pre-order, uh, assetless pre-order through draft to digital so, and asset, assetless pre-order directly to Amazon, from Amazon, because you can do that when you're direct. And I don't have it uh, yet up on Kobo because they don't allow assetless. And I don't even have a dummy file that I'm ready to, to load. I want to be a little bit closer uh, to the mark on that. But uh, that's that's a project to, to work on uh, soon. And, and so that's what's going on with the launch of Fear and Longing in Los Angeles. I've got other things going on, but I babbled on for way too long. So um, I am going to, again, skip any of the comments from recent episodes, but want to thank you for listening and thank you guys for commenting. You can comment on any episode of the show over at starkreflections.ca or you can at me on Twitter. I'm at Mark Leslie. So just before I introduce the interview portion uh, of this show, I want to talk a little bit about Writers of the Future. Now, I was honored to get to fly down to Writers of the Future in 2014 and give a keynote talk on the future of publishing as I saw it. I also had the honor, I was working for Kobo at the time, uh, I gave all of the winners a, um, a Kobo uh, device, uh, which was kind of it was so fun to get to hand it to them. And I announced that to them when I was on stage doing my keynote address to much applause, of course, which is really, really cool. Other cool thing is I got to uh, be the first person to wish uh, Orson Scott Card congratulations as he was uh, receiving his Lifetime Achievement Award. He was coming off stage as I was going on. And so in the wings, I just I got to be the first one to, uh, to congratulate him. That was kind of a, a cool moment. Uh, I even have a, a picture of him uh, accidentally photobombing me as I'm, I'm having my picture taken with um, Nancy Cartwright who uh, is the voice of Bart Simpson. She was sitting in the audience like a few people from me, and as the lights came on at the end of the show, uh, I turned to her and I was like, uh, excuse me, are you are you Nancy Cartwright? And uh, and, and, we, and we chatted. Uh, she, she actually ended up doing Bart's uh, voice for me. I did not ask her to. She just did it really quickly. And, uh, and it was kind of cool. Uh, it, it was one of those really fun uh, moments for me. But anyway, so I spent a week in, uh, in Los Angeles, uh, it was my first uh, extended stay other than like a layover at LAX uh, in Hollywood and exploring. It was a phenomenal experience. And a lot of that, the reason I'm, I'm getting into that is a lot of that went into um, fear and longing in Los Angeles because of the neighborhoods. Uh, even, you know, Michael stays at the same hotel I stayed at when I was, uh, you know, just off the strip in Hollywood. 
and and so there's a lot of uh, a lot of sites that I uh, I got to see when I was there that I got to incorporate into it. But um, uh, you know, and I got to spend some time with Emily there, and I've also seen her at some of the trade shows uh, and other events where I've seen the good folks from Writers of the Future. But I'm really thrilled because this this is like a, a an unprecedented um, opportunity that Emily's going to share about what Writers of the Future is and how how it can help beginning science fiction writers. I also had the great honor of speaking with John Goodwin uh, from uh, from Writers of the Future, from Author Services, Inc. And uh, and John's the, the head publisher, I think, oh my God, what's his title? Um, publisher uh, or president uh, of, of the publishing uh, empire. And I've known them both for years. They're wonderful folks. And John interviewed me on the Writers of the Future podcast, which was a lot of fun because we got to talk about all kinds of things. We got to talk again about the future of publishing and writing and, what you know, because I'm a Canadian, we, we, we focused a little bit on some of the differences between the U.S. and Canada. And then, of course, I had, I had a blast uh, talking about the Canadian uh, werewolf books with him. So then it was really, really cool. You know, John and I had that chat and then a week, a week or so later, uh, I had the opportunity to sit down with Emily uh, virtually and uh and chat with her and so this is a really uh fun discussion and uh let's just get on uh, to the discussion instead of talking about it why don't i just shut my yap and let you listen to this stimulating conversation with emily hey emily thank you so much for hanging out with me today hey thank you so much it's great to see you again mark yeah it's been way too long since we've seen each other yeah, many years actually. Last yeah. uh, when you were out at the Writers of the Future event to speak. Yeah, wow. It's it's. Uh, uh, I hate to count the years, um, but <laughs> I want to get into Writers of the Future. Can you talk a little bit? So, what is the what is the the contest, and how does this work? So, Writers of the Future. It's an international writing contest that's been going for thirty seven years. It was started by L. Ron Hubbard back in the eighties. And it just, it's a free contest. Anybody can enter. Uh, there are no restrictions on age, gender, race, religion, you know, anywhere in the world, anybody can enter. It's free to enter. It's a blind judge contest. It's short story writing, science fiction, fantasy. So we get stories in from all over the world. And we have this amazing uh, blue ribbon panel of judges that review the stories that come in. But as I mentioned, it's a blind judge contest. So when the stories come in, the name gets removed and you, it's strictly on merit alone. So, you know, and, and your story gets seen by people like Brandon Sanderson, Dave Farland, Orson Scott Card, Larry Niven, Tim Powers. I mean, there's about 30 judges. I mean, that's only a handful of, you know, the amazing authors that uh, contribute their time. And it's, it's all there as like a pay it forward, a uh, helping hand for new aspiring authors. And uh, it's something that, you know, it's still funded by L. Ron Hubbard to this day as a way to give back because he himself was a science fiction fantasy writer. And well, he actually wrote in all genres. He wrote <laughs> yeah, he, but, did. he wrote mysteries and all kinds of he, stuff. Yeah. He wrote mystery, he wrote Western, he wrote detective yeah. noir and, and um, a lot in the 1930s and 40s. And uh, yeah. in the 80s, he was he did the Battlefield Earth and Mission Earth. And then that was around the time when he started the contest. So the right. contest is in science fiction fantasy. And um, it's been going, it just grows every year. We don't give out the numbers of entries, but it's a lot. Wow. And, uh, and it's a free yeah. contest and it's quarterly, right? There's like four times a year you can, you can enter? That's right. So um, it's, it's divided by four quarters each year. Anybody can enter. You can enter all four quarters if you want. But wow. each quarter, there's a first, second, third place winner. And then at the end of the year, all of those winners, so there's 12 of them for the year, they all get published in the annual anthology. I have one here. <laughs> this is, is that the latest one? This is the latest one. Oh, I don't, I don't think I've seen that yet. That well, I'll sad. have to send you one. Wow, so it's gorgeous. It and so the the winners get published in here. So there's 12 short stories, and then there's also a companion art contest, Illustrators of the Future, where like the winning art for the oh my god, yeah, gets published in there. There's some really just amazing stuff. Um, kind of see wow and it's all it's all in science fiction fantasy but um just some serious talent i'll just show you a few it's amazing wow yeah so so the 12 winners both writer and illustrator get published in the anthology every year 
And we also fly them out to Hollywood for a week long workshop with those judges that I mentioned earlier. They also fly into Hollywood. And it's like a week long boot camp uh, that culminates at the end of the week in a big awards event where, you know, we have it's a big red carpet event. It's kind of like the Oscars for the writers and uh, black tie. It, yeah, it's such a oh, wow. It was such an amazing experience to be there. I mean, just off the strip on uh, the Hollywood strip and then the black tie event. But so w- one of the things I loved and I want to get into some of the things that you guys do with the authors, because I think it's like it's like a world renowned experience that most authors will never uh get to experience which i think is amazing but uh you've got the 12 writers and the 12 Mm -hmm. illustrators and then what happens is there's the art reveal i remember being there for the art reveal and it was such a beautiful experience can you talk a little yeah for sure that's like one of the most emotional parts Uh, i always have to bring my tissue for that particular event so what happens is is there's you know, there's a writer winner and an illustrator winner will get paired up with the, with one of the stories. So they will illustrate one of the stories out of the book. And so the artist, you know, he reads the story, he, you know, creates his illustration. That's actually what gets published in the book. But the authors haven't met the illustrators and vice versa. So they come here to do their workshops. And then at some point in the middle of the week, there's a big art reveal, we call it. And um, so you have like all the there's like uh, easels with art all around the room and the, and the art is placed on the easels and the illustrators are kind of like in the back along the back wall, kind of waiting in the art and the writers come in and they have to find their piece that goes with their story. And they usually find it immediately. And then the <laughs> illustrator comes over and, and it's just the sweetest thing. Like you see these, they're hugging and crying and, and, you know, wow, <laughs> somebody made that for my story. And then the illustrator's like, oh my gosh, do you like it? And, <laughs> and it's just such a, an emotional moment. And then, you know, it's, it's nice when we're able to capture that in photos and stuff, but, um, and then they'll just be talking and then they're like, becomes best buds for life after that. And, you know, It's just a really special moment when they get to like see that something they wrote, they created in their mind and put on paper. And then this illustrator comes and creates, you know, their interpretation of it. And it's just been a huge, like emotional event every year. And uh, it's something definitely we look forward to that happens like a couple of days before the big gala event. Yeah, I remember watching it too. And it was, yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of like, it's tear provoking uh, yeah. to see it's, it's beautiful to see these, these two creative forces come together and kind of, uh, yeah, it's just this wonderful uh, moment of harmony uh, that happens. But there's other things that happen during the week as well. And it, it and you mentioned some of the names of some of the people that actually um, get to uh, teach them and do workshops with them. What's, what's the experience like? So when they come here, let's say, take the writer workshop, they arrive here, they, you know, they go into, it's literally like a boot camp week long workshop that, you know, if they've come and they've won the contest, then they have talent already and they know how to put a story together. They know how to structure a sentence. So the workshop more is on like the the business of writing and how to make it in the industry. And, um, you know, they'll polish them up also on their story writing. And, but the, there's like a week where you have like David Farland, uh, Tim Powers and Orson Scott Carr that will lead the main, you know, structured workshop where they really also get their productivity up because, you know, some, like if you're writing short stories and, you know, magazines come and they, they come and they go and there's deadlines. So they'll, they'll get them in that frame of mind of completing things as well. And they actually have a, a 24 hour short story that they have to write as part of the workshop. Wow. And uh, some of them are like, that's terrifying, but the results are amazing because they've just been through a whole workshop on how to do this and what to do. So when they actually finally do it, 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 it the results are spectacular. And some people have taken those short stories and they have been published, no editing, nothing. They have submitted those stories and had them published. So it's been wow. a real success and, and they really work with them on research and they go to the library and they go learn, you know, to get inspiration and they'll go out on the street and talk to strangers and, Then once they're through that part, then we have the guest speakers coming in and the other judges. So then one day they'll spend a day, you know, an afternoon with Larry Niven and then another afternoon with Robert J. Sawyer and Brandon Sanderson and Nettie Okorafor. And so they'll get different aspects of the industry and different aspects of of the, you know, the editing cycle or different, you know, or being at conventions 
the different perspectives from the different authors. So by the time they leave here, they're, they're completely packed with information. They go home, they take three weeks to digest it all and then start putting it to use. Wow. I think uh, the, the year that I was there, I remember there was a day, I think Tim must have taken them. Was it to the, uh, the printing facility where they were actually seeing the book be made? Yes. And I was like, they, oh my God. <laughs> yeah. We have done that numerous times where they actually went to the printing house and watched the books come off the, the printer right there live. We've done different activities with them. Some of them, you know, have gone like one year we took them all to JPL and another, you know, yeah. uh, taking an NASA one year. So there's different activities that happen, but uh, yeah, I remember that when you were here, they did, they went to the print shop and they were smelling the books and they were like, <laughs> oh. they were finding their story right away. They're like, Oh my God, it's so story. And it was like, still like, you know, wasn't even cut yet. It's very sweet. Yeah. And I remember, I mean, the gala event was, was something else. Um, uh, that was the first time as a keynote speaker, I had ever had the luxury and privilege of using a teleprompter, which makes you look so smart. <laughs> it was so cool. Yeah. That made uh, for a smooth experience. Yeah. I mean, I also, I mean, I, I'm, I'm honored. I got to be, uh, I got to be the first person to congratulate uh, Orson Scott Card when he got the Lifetime Achievement Award, because I was on stage right after him. So as he was coming off stage, I'm like, congratulations, as I was nervously heading out. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, nice. so that, that event is uh, pretty amazing. Like I, I think uh, Wolf Moon, uh, mm -hmm. I, I saw recently, he shared some pictures was he was sitting beside I think it was Dean Wesley Smith on one side of them and Robert J. Sawyer on the other. And they're, and they're all signing copies of, of, of oh, yeah. volumes and everyone's dressed and it looks so beautiful. And it was just this amazing event. And I remember cheekily saying to some of the authors, like, um, take lots of pictures because your next book launch probably won't be quite so elegant. That's the truth. I mean, it's it's definitely the full Hollywood experience when they come here for the event. And, um, you know, they it, it's true they don't, their next signing won't exactly be like that. But, you know, once they get like that, it's like a huge amount of pressure. There's a there's they sign like at least five, six hundred books in that night of the event with the people that have attended the event. And then there's a ton of networking and uh, a lot of, you know, everybody's there from the industry. So, then, you know, once they go out, we send them back home after they're done with all of this, then we send them out on book signing tours and media tours, and we book them on radio shows and TV shows and um, send them around, you know, doing book signings. And once they have that experience here, anything else we send them out to do is like, oh, I got this, you know, so it doesn't even compare. <laughs> they put me on stage in front of a thousand people when I was in Hollywood. <laughs> On a red carpet with microphones in my face. So but the yeah. great thing is, is if you've connected them to local media to do something like in their state or province or wherever they are in the world, that that can help them for their next release, because now they have a contact at the radio station or, or whatever. Right. So it it really um, I think one of the one of the hidden elements that's not necessarily obvious is the you get you, you have a relationship with some of the judges because you get to spend time learning from them one on one. You get relationships in the industry. There may be media contacts that you get. You get like I think it's a, a, an amazing relationship building experience too. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that happens every year that is just a big deal for these guys, it, like I said, the networking. But they do the workshops all day long, and then at night, if I'm looking for any judge or any winner, I'm going to find them all at the bar with the judges, just picking their brains till two in the morning. Um, I don't yeah. know if these people ever sleep when they're here. Uh, we give them time to sleep, but they're, they want to get as much as they can while they can. And they make lifelong friends and, you know, the writers, they, you know, now in these days we have social media and internet and stuff. So it's much easier for them to get to know each other. And, and, you know, we still also stay connected with them. Like when we go to like conventions and stuff, we will bring, you know, we'll have a place at the, at the writers of the future and galaxy press booth where, you know, past winners of the contest can come in and we'll give them a space. If they have new books out, they can autograph books. If they don't happen to have a new book out, they can sign writers of future books. But um, so that's always nice. And, you know, like last year we were in Salt Lake City and we had people from volume 17, volume nine, and, you know, wow. now we're on volume 37. <laughs> so once you're kind of part of the family, we will take care of you as long as, long yeah. as you, I mean, as long as we have your email address and phone number and reach you. 
<laughs> and I know I remember I, I I I've seen you guys at Book Expo America, uh, Frankfurt Book Fair in Germany, uh, uh, London Book Fair, and yeah. I think it might have been London Book Fair where I I bumped into one of your authors who was actually there signing copies of the recently released and like oh my god this is awesome <laughs> yeah um so 2020 was an odd year yes. um. Uh, was there a giant gala <laughs> in person event? How did how did how did you have to deal with the pandemic and everything? Well, okay, so that obviously changed everything because you know normally we bring everybody into Hollywood, we fly them from all over the world. We had winners from Volume Thirty Six from Australia and England and Iran and all these different places that um, we were not able to fly them in just because of the pandemic. So we originally had postponed it to the fall because our event is normally in April. Right. But again, in the fall, it was still not safe to bring people in. So we asked the winners themselves, you know, if they would like to have a virtual event or if they would rather hold off and do a combined event, like a double whammy in, in 2021 with the volume 37 winners. And I think almost a hundred, I think out of the 24 you know, because there's 12 writers, 12 illustrators, only one person wanted, was okay with doing it virtual. So they were definitely wanting to come here and have the full experience. So we decided to postpone the event. Wow. We did, however, do a virtual art reveal because we were going to really, we did release the book, yes. the, the one that I showed you, the volume 36. We did release that one. So, um, so we did the art reveal before releasing it so that, you know, they got to have that experience. And it was still, you know, super emotional. And you can still find that on the writers of the future YouTube channel. If anybody wanted to see that art reveal. Oh, um, you know what? I, I haven't seen that. I'm going to have to check. Oh, it out. Oh. You have to go. You have to check it out. It, yeah. It's not quite the same as being there live, but you know, there was definitely some emotion going on in there. Well, I can stuff. imagine. I just, uh, I, I know the photographers that I've seen there just amazing, uh, amazingly talented people. So I can imagine the videographers are probably just as, you know, zooming in on, on the right moments. <laughs> Yeah, um, well, we literally did it as a Zoom event. Oh, or, that's right. It was Zoom. It wasn't. I it keep was thinking Zoom, it's yeah. in person. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, I wish it was in person. <laughs> um, but yeah, we did it in Zoom. So you'll see all the heads all across the screen. You know? heads, <laughs> yeah, of course. And, but we showed the art. So you'll it flips through each of the art pieces. And then the the art the artist and the writer will, you know, connect up and talk about it for a little bit before we go on to the next one. So you, you get to see actually more of it than you would if you're in the room because you can hear only like two people at a time. So you get to see all of it there. So that was nice. We did that. And then, like I said, we decided to postpone the event and um, we're looking at doing it later this year in 2021. And one cool thing is um, Echo Chernick, she's our coordinating judge for the illustrator contest. She did the cover art for this one. Okay. Yeah, and that's gorgeous. how we decided to do it is um, she's doing a, a follow-up to this one. So it has a similar look like the same character right. so there'll be like a, a back to back you know so because we always do like the the stage is like the theme of the book cover so be, we're yeah. not going to shaft yes. one year versus the other so we kind of have the same artist doing the same theme so they all get it's like one big happy family it's going to be a rowdy bunch of 48 oh, it's going to be big <laughs> <laughs> but it's going to be great i can't wait we, we're, we're definitely excited having everybody wow. back here again. So this amazing opportunity that any writer. So uh, one of the caveats is uh, if you have had a professional sale, you're not eligible to enter it basically, right? Yeah, you can go. Anybody can go to writers of the future dot com. And right there on the site, the rules are listed. Um, it's not that it's up to a certain amount of sales. And if you're self-published, it's up to a certain amount, like 5000 hits. Right, right. So, um, so anybody can just go there and see the rules at writersofthefuture.com if they have any question about whether they're qualified or not, because it is a contest for amateurs, you're right. right. But, um, but there's a qual what it states on there on the website, what qualifies amateur. So, right. You know, right. Yeah. I mean, if you sold, think, yeah, I've sold the story, but not for professional rates or, or whatever, then yeah. yeah you, it's like so, three stories and like a certain amount of sales. So, yeah. You know, yeah. So some people will think that they're not qualified but they actually are so it's definitely worth checking excellent. out excellent and and i think um it's a free contest and it's really designed to help kickstart and help beginning writers recognize you know work through the obviously the the craft um uh, yeah because that's how they get there mm -hmm. yeah that's the, the purpose of it that's the whole purpose of the contest when Elrond hubbard started it is because you you have somebody who's out there and they 
they don't have a voice, they don't have the connection, but they have the talent and it just gives them a voice and it gives them, you know, puts them in view of, you know, people who, who themselves are extremely successful, who say this person has talent and it's not based on who they are or anything other than their talent alone. And that's the way that Ellen Hubbard designed it so that it just get, made a level playing field for anybody to be able to have an even chance of winning. Wow. And then on top of that, uh, <laughs> and I think it was just, just in 2020 that you launched an additional resource, again, completely free for writers. Can you talk about your uh, the Writers of the Future online workshops? Yeah, for sure. So one of the things that a lot of people look forward to uh, wanting to win the contest, there is, I did not mention earlier, but there is cash prizes. You can win anything from 500 to a thousand dollars for winning the contest. Oh yeah. It's not two. just a trip to, to, to. It's not just a Hollywood trip. Yeah. You also get cash prize. You also get paid pro rates for your short story. And, yeah. uh, and then there's a grand prize winner that gets announced at the big event and they get an additional check for 5,000, one writer, one illustrator. So in addition to that, um, one of the big things um, that people want, you know, when they, when they, why they want to win this contest is because they get to come and be a part of that workshop. Like people so want to be in that room with Orson Scott Card and Tim Powers and Dave Farland and Brandon Sanderson and Larry Niven and Rob Sawyer and all these guys, uh, because it's such a wealth of information and they just are learning from these greats. And so we keep getting emails like, look, I had, I had two honorable mentions this year and I'm like so close, but if I could just get in that workshop, then I might, you know, so people want to get in on this workshop. So what we did at the beginning of the, we actually put it out at the beginning of the lockdown, like shortly after the pandemic started and, and people couldn't go out. We took all like the, some of the basics. It's not the full workshop, but it's like basics that you learn in the workshop and it's, it's led by um, David Farland, Orson Scott Card, and Tim Powers. And it's a free online writing workshop. It's at writersofthefuture.com. And we, we put it up there for anybody to uh, come and participate. There's uh, 12 sections. There's, um, I think it's, there's over 10 videos in there from these, wow. these guys. And uh, it's about five hours worth of, five or six hours worth of videos on there. And there's essays by Ellen Hubbard and Al just Budris and anybody goes through and it takes you step by step, you know, from the beginning, from research, uh, you know, writing dialogue, writing narration, how to start, begin, complete a story, how to add suspense, how to, you know, emotion, um, art, and then productivity. So you get that kind of stuff on the, on the online workshop and then you get a little certificate at the end that says, you know, oh, I completed the writers of the future wor- online workshop. And, um, so, and there's also transcripts with all the videos and it's set up so, for people to go at their own pace. So we put it up there. So, you know, some people do it on weekends and, and there is no strict class to follow. You just go through your own pace. You can go back as many times as you want, reread right. something, you watch something, and we put that up and, you know, we were, we were hoping, you know, that we would be able to help a few hundred people. And within 48 hours, we had 2000 people sign up and we were <laughs> like, whoa. <laughs> and um, now wow. I think it's over, I think it's up 5,000 now from 108 countries. So it's wow. been extremely popular. Yeah. Wow. And, and people from anywhere in the world can, can, can take advantage of this for free, which is amazing. Yes. And I just checked it out today. It looks like about 160 Canadians have gone on and done the course. So (laughs) I'm not partial or anything. (laughs) So uh, sort of as we, as we wrap up a couple final questions, I'm I'm dying to ask you, and I've never asked you this is um, uh, have you ever taken advantage of the learning about writing or, or illustrating? And are you a writer or illustrator yourself? Or, or is there some other creative pursuit singing? Like, what is it? What's your forte? Well, I mean, I, I obviously run the public relations for author services and, and the contest. And so, you know, my writing is very different. It's the, it's the press releases <laughs> the and the blogs and the, you know, and the, the bios and the helping people with different aspects of, of that. But like I, like I said, the videos and, and the essays, I've probably watched all those videos at least five or 10 times over as I put the course together. So, right, right. um, yeah, but it's, 
yeah, I mean, of course, I, I, every time I listen to these guys or watch them, I always learn something. It's, they're amazing. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you for spending uh, time with me today. Can you please let my listeners know just, uh, I guess, is it writers of the future.com? Is that pretty much the place where you can find all the information? Yeah. And the writers of the future.com is kind of like the one-stop shop for everything. That's where you can find like the anthology. You can also get that at galaxy press or Amazon. Um, and then, or anywhere books are sold. The, the right, this is the latest one. Yeah. Pay attention. Gorgeous. Number 36. That's number 36. That's the one that's out right now. 37 yeah. will be coming out later this year. But um, yeah, that's it. You can find that at writersofthefuture.com, galaxypress.com, or Amazon, or anywhere books are sold. The contest is at writersofthefuture.com, and so is the online workshop and all the information, the history of the contest, anything you want to know about it is also there. So, and then we awesome. have uh, social media channels, um, Wolf, W O T F, or Writers of the Future, Wolf Contest. Um, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, you can go there and, um, keep, keep tabs on what's happening with the contest and, um, who's winning and all the excitement. Awesome. And there will be all those links that, uh, Emily mentioned will be in the show notes at starkreflections.ca. Emily, on behalf of writers, uh, especially speculative fiction, science fiction, fantasy writers, thank you so much for doing all this for them. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me on. And, um, Thanks for representing Canada for us over there and getting the word out. <laughs> Go Canada. Thanks, Em. Yeah. There are two things I want to reflect on with this uh, conversation with Emily. The first one is, I think it was a mistake I made. Uh, so the contest, uh, Writers of the Future contest, is open to amateur writers, meaning you, you haven't been paid professional rights. But there was a caveat, I think, as Emily mentioned, that it was like a... If you've earned less than five thousand dollars from your sales, that still you would still qualify. And I think early on in my writing uh, career, when I may have only had a single professional sale, I thought I wasn't qualified. And and that first story, ironically, was uh, my very first professional sale was a science fiction story that I sold to uh, an anthology to be used in grade school uh, science for for young uh, for young folks. And I think after I got that, I thought, well, I, I, I'd never submitted to Writers of the Future again because I guess I didn't read the fine print. I didn't read the details. So the lesson for you, learn from my mistakes. I make lots of them. The lesson for you, dear listener, is check the entry and qualification details because you never know. You may think you don't qualify, but perhaps you do qualify. The second thing is related to that. Again, it's the... It's this amazing opportunity for writers. When, when I look back at all of the, the places I've been, the things I've seen, the publications I've been involved in, uh, I just am overwhelmed with how massive this opportunity really is in a world where there's not a lot of opportunities within traditional publishing like there were in, in the, you know, the glory days of 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 indie pub of of traditional publishing where there were when I started in the book industry there were twelve or thirteen big publishers major publishers and they slowly have merged back down to the you know the the top five that we have today so for writers of of speculative fiction so science fiction fantasy horror and those genres um, this is likely the 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 largest opportunity for uh, a chance for income for selling your fiction and making money, for exposure to a global audience, Galaxy Press makes this anthology available everywhere. It's, it's amazing. And, 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 with beautiful, beautiful art. I recently commissioned a, a piece of artwork from the very talented Nicolette Jones, who I met at uh, When Words Collide in Calgary. And, and there's nothing like the experience of seeing what an artist can do with your writing. I, I, Emily talked about that and and I was there. I, I witnessed it. It was truly beautiful that one year that I got to watch the authors and the writers, uh, that magical moment uh, when they did that sharing. But so you get that um, exposure to a global audience with money, not just exposure, but exposure with pay. But then on top of it, you get that week-long boot camp and a learning and networking opportunity the likes of which you'll probably never have access to again. And it's free to enter. 
not even like five dollars to enter or ten dollars or fifty dollars it's free to enter and you can enter four times a year so it's kind of like uh you know if you're an indie author and you're trying to get a book bub well and submit submit every 30 days or trying to get a promo through cobra writing life just keep submitting uh so that's the that's the important thing it's free so uh, and and even if you uh, don't qualify because you've already earned enough uh, money in, in publishing, uh, there's the free online workshops. So it's definitely worth checking out, even if you've been doing this for a while. So here, here's a personal example. Despite having you know been writing horror for decades, I think what was my first published horror story was in 1993 that actually got purchased by a magazine through the old uh, trad pub uh, methods. So despite all of my experience in, in writing horror, I recently, just in, in the fall of 2020, I took one of Dean Wesley Smith's online uh, writing workshops on, on horror. Now, Dean, of course, I should mention, is a previous winner of the Writers of the Future Award and, and has also a uh, long time been a judge uh, for the Writers uh, of the Future uh, contests. Um, but I took that workshop. And, and I mean, I learned from Dean all the time, of course, but I learned something new from it. I, I wrote a, a fresh new story that I'm really pleased with, prompted by Dean uh, in, in, in the class, because there, there, there was a little bit of interactivity. It's, it's mostly watching videos, but then he would actually look at the weekly assignments and, and make comments. And it was just like this one line comment that turned into a story for me, which is sometimes how it is. But for this course, uh, this online course, I was just I was just thinking about that as I was listening back to the interview with Emily, and yeah, yeah, I mean, I learned so much from from David Farland when I when I get to uh, attend his sessions at Superstars Writing Seminars uh, every year, not this year, of course, but uh, again next year, um, and I'm sure that I'm going to learn uh, even more from from David as well as from Tim Powers and Orson Scott Card via this free course. It's what, five or six hours? And uh, yeah, it would probably inspire me because I don't write a lot of actual science fiction. So I think that would be a great opportunity for me. It's probably a great opportunity for you. Potentially, even if you don't write science fiction, fantasy, or horror, I'm willing to bet that there's some craft of writing, uh, business of writing details that will probably apply to you. Just like on this podcast, I interview writers and I interview folks from the industry, I interview authors and uh, illustrators and artists and musicians, because I know we can learn from anyone out there, uh, because there's ways you can apply that learning to you, your writing business and your craft of writing. Because we, us reflectives, we're always learning, we're always growing, we're always expanding those opportunities that uh, are available for us and creating our opportunities by working hard. Well, that's it for this episode of the Stark Reflections podcast. I hope you enjoyed the interview. I hope you enjoyed the reflections and all the other babblings that I do. If you like this podcast, one of the things you can do to help me is you can spread the word by leaving a review on the podcatcher of your choice or tell a friend, someone that you think would find value in listening to these Stark Reflections. If you're so inclined, you could also support the podcast over on patreon.com slash starkreflections, where for as little as $1, $3, or $5 a month, you get access to additional bonus content, which include additional reflections on other podcasts and other video and audio and text content that I make available to my patrons. And a huge, huge thank you and shout out to all of you patrons who support this podcast on patreon.com slash stark reflections. I know times are tough and um, there's a lot going on in the world. And the fact that uh, you're not only listening, but also supporting this podcast really truly means a great deal to me. So thank you to my patrons and thank you to all my listeners for being with me for this episode. So until next episode, which is going to be episode 180, this is Mark Leslie Lefebvre wishing you great writing and good stark reflections. Thank you for listening to the Stark Reflections podcast. You can find show notes for each episode at starkreflections.ca. The music for this podcast, Laser Groove, was composed and produced by Kevin McLeod. Check out more of Kevin's great music at incomptech.com.